Welcome to another episode of the Hospitality Mentor Podcast, and today I am very excited. This was one that was long in the making, but we've got my friend, Gabriel Perez, the COO of Lodging for the Indigo Road Hospitality Group. Gabriel, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you for the consideration and for thinking of me. No, oh, absolutely. You have such great experience and a unique background that I think the listeners here will really enjoy it. But we started off always the same way. What was your very first job in hospitality? Uh, my very first job in hospitality was a pool bar attendant for Intercontinental Hotel Caracas. It was called the Tamanaco Intercontinental Hotel. And uh, when I say pool bar attendant, I don't mean bartender was an attendant who was picking up ashtrays and empty those ashtrays because people used to smoke a lot in the 80s, especially in South America, and uh, remove uh, plastic cups from the pool area, made sure that people would have everything they needed to have a very good experience. So the titles sound kind of glamorous, you know, pool attendant, but it wasn't really anything off more than just being of service to our customers and our guests. That is amazing. For some reason, I don't know this. So my mom is from Venezuela and I have been to the Caracas Intercontinental when I was a kid. So I might have been at that pool with everyone smoking Long feverishly out there, drinking their scotch on the rocks. There is a big possibility that I empty your mom's ashtray. She smoked. And the fun, it was our uniform. I don't know if you remember late 80s. I'm sure you do, but we had uh, the polo shirt and we needed to wear the neck up. We also, oh, had, uh, yeah, we also had to um, uh, wear the white Reebok shoes that were trendy at the time. So it, it was just a fun aspect. Show business. As you, know. you were stylish in Venezuela running around the pool. It was full uniform, all white. So you're doing that. And is it just a summer job that you have as a kid? Like how old were you when you're doing this? I, I was 18. So 18. Uh, 18. Is that what you wanted to do? Or was it just like, I had to get a job in Venezuela? And... No, I, I had a, a little bit of uh, knowledge of the English language, just a little bit. And I said, what can I do here that is different? Um, that is not a regular job where I can utilize the little bit of English that I know with the Spanish and, you know, make it fun. Something that is different every day, nothing behind a counter or behind a desk. So this opportunity, you know, I applied for the hotel being the most prestigious hotel in, in Caracas at the time. And they say, well, we only have this position and you can grow with, uh, the company if you put your mind and your heart to it. I didn't even listen to that phrase. I just said, I'll take this. So I did and I enjoyed it. I had a good time. It was a beautiful place to work at and what inspired me was that people will entrust us with their lives, cherish moments of their vacation mm -hmm. uh, for us to create experiences to them. So I, I saw it as an opportunity to be part of their life, their movie, whatever they were creating. I was just of help. And I thought that this could be a career path for me. Why not? I am enjoying it. Um, it's something that is rewarding, uh, it is within my nature to do it. So why not? So I continue working, uh, I grew through the front desk, assistant front desk manager, then uh, shift manager, and then not auditor all the way down until I came to Miami or continental a couple of years later. And that's where my career deployed through consistency, hard work, and a lot of hours. A lot of hours and you grew, like you said, you came to Miami. So what was that conversation like with your family? Because you're in Venezuela, you're in your country. That's where you grew up. I well, assume. John, um, I had a conversation with them and they took a, like, this guy is going to disappear for two months and we're going to see him back unemployed and looking for a job. I'm sure that's what they thought. And, um, but I was committed. I said, I need to do this. I would like to do this. And it was a pretty good program at the time. Intercontinental had this program called MTEC for management training and executive development. Yep. And um, I, I wanted to take advantage of that. And why not? So 
as far as my family was concerned, they thought that I was going to be back in a couple of months, um, having breakfast with them in the morning and going to whatever job I chose at the time. But no, it was a great progression yeah. for the so, building of my career. I would say you, you joined the Intercontinental, and it's a very different time when you joined than it is right now in the city of Miami. It was just Intercontinental Hotels. Right. So I remember that time, you're there, 91, 92. That it was a little scary in downtown Miami. Like people didn't really go out at night. Like there was like you went to work and then you left, and it was just yeah. that's uh, Miami and Bayside. Yeah, it, it was. Miami is always changing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, in my opinion, it's always evolving for the best. Yes. At that time, as you mentioned, it it, it could have been really rocky, and it was. In fact, um, downtown was. There were just a few good hotels. Uh, it didn't have the hospitality presence that now, it now features. And I remember we were competing with high, the Sheraton Brico Point, if you remember that hotel. Yep. Um, where on the other side of the bridge. And where the Viceroy or W is now. Mm-hmm. Correct. And the Omni, uh, a little bit farther north on, on Biscayne Boulevard. So the, I would say there were crazy times because Miami was like breaking out of that mold of perception of being a um, place of refuge for many Latin Americans who were living in Cuba and South America. It was transcending to the Miami Vice era, the fashion and model industry, the film industry. So it was that crack where you had celebrities move into Miami. You had the Sylvester Stallone, the Madonnas, all all the people who Johnny Versace, there. all these guys. Yeah, yeah. To either the Grove, South Beach. Um, but nevertheless, very interesting and 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 very uh of very good use to to my career for sure. No, and, and you did great there. You're there for a year and change, and then you start making some interesting moves as you grow, because like mm-hmm. you said. Yeah, you know, there weren't too many hotels to work at at that time, so you made some moves. Yeah, and and you can stop me, but I I want to jump to when you get to the Ritz Plaza Hotel. But was there anything in between getting there to the Ritz, whether it's at Sheraton Brickle Point or David William Hotel, that was memorable to you? Yeah, I would say that the David William Hotel was my first uh, experience in the Gables, um, and it was an interesting experience because not only was a very good hotel at the time, it had a great French restaurant called Chez Vendôme. I don't know if many people remember this on, on remember this, that one. this podcast, but uh, that was the French restaurant in Coral Gables. And I didn't know when I started working there, but I could see celebrities left and right, more than what I saw at the Intercontinental going to that place in Coral Gables. In addition, it was my first experience with the condo hotel model mm. in that 200 individually unit, uh, own units uh, run entirely by the condominium hotel. Uh, from the customer perspective, it was nothing else but a hotel, but internally it was, uh, and I'm sure it continues to be the same, a condominium hotel. Yeah, see, it's amazing. And I have to go by there. I haven't been by it in a long time. Yeah. But you make a pit stop there for two years, you're learning a lot, you're in that hot spot of Coral Gables, then you move to a place that you become familiar with in Miami Beach. Yeah. You're at the Ritz Plaza Hotel for five years. What hotel is that now? That is the SLS. That's the SLS Hotel now. Perfect. So you're in the heart of South Beach during that time as a rooms division manager. What do you remember from that experience? Because that's when you're starting to really grow. Yeah. I remember a lot of glamour, a lot of fun, a lot of color. A lot of uh, new things happening in the industry and in the in the market in the area. Not only limited to hospitality, but uh, you will see new stores, new cafes popping up, new buildings being erected, old buildings being repurposed or refurbished, and every day seemed like a sunny day. Um, I was super inspired. Um, we at that hotel. Um, right before the Delano came to the map, we were kind of the place. Right. Um, and we were the destination for fashion and film. We had shoots from MTV, Vogue International, uh, Playboy, 
if we had it all, just think about anything that comes on a screen, a catalog or a magazine. Our hotel most likely was a setting and the background for, for that uh, photo shoot. And we were very successful. I think we, among other couple of boutique hotels, led the way to what South Beach became for, for quite a few years, which mm -hmm. was that emblematic sense of beauty and perfect tenness. All <laughs> uh, a lot of culinary good restaurants came to the picture at the time as you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very, uh, very exciting time to be part of Miami Beach as an experience because Miami Beach went from that dormant, tacit destination of the late 80s to early 90s to what it is today on that transitional period. So I feel very lucky that I was there when I was there and I got to see that change from Sleepy tourist town, uh, post um, Al Pacino movies to yep. what it became. Yeah, and so I'm, that's why I was excited to talk to you today because we haven't had a chance to talk about this in our conversations. It's more for myself because I was a teenager during that time, and my in my head I still remember it as like a glamorous time on Miami Beach, like Ocean Drive. I remember it was like you would go there; it was like a special night out, and you could mm -hmm. have a nice meal, and it wasn't what it is. Today and you've had a lot of experience on Ocean Drive. Is, yeah. Am I remembering that the right way? Is it oh. was it like that as I remember it as a kid? You are remembering a fact, um, but it, it wasn't what preceded it. What preceded that section that you're remembering was a time where you had literally um, like my old Jewish well, grandmother was there. That's what it was, and, and it was like. And, and once it was star, you had cis workers on Washington Avenue or Collins Avenue. And a lot of uh, a lot of petty crime. Um, you could not identify organized crime as you were driving by, but you could see uh, a lot of deals in every single corner. Uh, and all of a sudden, that started disappearing. I will have to say that the city of Miami Beach, um, your Dermer and, and and others that preceded him, did a great job about changing what Miami Beach was. Uh, and bringing back those good historic elements to the front, not going back, but bringing those good ones to the front to make sure that Miami Beach became what it became. But it was rough. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> well, you saw it transform. And I yeah. remember yeah. like I started coming back because I left for school and I came back in the 2000s. And that's when I started working at the Lowe's right when I first opened. And that kind of helped change a little bit that section. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Talking about you, you're at this Ritz Plaza. You've kind of been in these higher end hotels for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you make kind of a, a an interesting move. Very interesting. And you become a, a first time general manager, which is everybody's goal. Yeah. Um, and you do it at the Extended Stay America brand. How does that happen? Because that's a big life change. Well, it happened because uh, of, of personal reasons. I was, I purchased a home by Sawgrass at the time. Uh, I was living in that area and coming to my drive. every single day was rough. And this opportunity seemed like a low hanging fruit. And, um, you know, we can always be month morning quarterbacks and say, I shouldn't have done that. I could have stayed in the glamour city of Miami beach and continue the growth because many hotels open, but that perhaps was my feeling two to three years after I did that, but not anymore. And I'll tell you why. Tell me. Because I learned a completely new operating model, which is a structure on solely efficiency. Zero experience from the guest perspective, but it tells you and it shows you and it taught me a lot of how to preserve the bottom line. So it was more of a store driven type of model, yet applied to the hospitality. And when I say hospitality, I'm, I'm being very, uh, very abundant <laughs> with that concept when it comes to that type of hotels. But it was something that opened the door to me to extend the state model. It's a very, very profitable model. It was a very profitable model, remains as one of the segments that is the most profitable from an owner's perspective. It is a still something that attracts a lot of uh, clients and guests, 
because it fits uh, a need within the industry. I personally like, as I said, the efficiency models and what it taught me as it relates to cost control, inventory controls, yet being a hospitality person myself, um, I decided to pursue something else moving forward. But the experience that I gained there and the knowledge of how to um, safeguard, if I can use that word, mm -hmm. every single penny on the operation was very, very illustrative and very well suited. So I, I'm, I'm very happy that I did that move today. I wasn't very happy four or five years after I did it, thinking that I regressed my career by that amount of years or maybe more. Yep. But as I progress, I realized that it gave me a lot of knowledge that my competitors and my friendly colleagues did not have. Yeah. And I'm grateful I was for that. Yeah, and you were there for a short time. And so what I was interested in on this mm -hmm. too, I, I appreciate you being so honest with it because it helps people see because a lot of people have this thought like, oh, maybe I just take a step mm -hmm. back and do this. But you got stamped as a general manager. Mm -hmm. right? And I've had this conversation with people and I haven't had a chance to ask somebody who's been through it. So you get stamped as a general manager. You're a general manager for the rest of your career right. in doing my research, right? Okay. You may not have gotten to that level if you went from manager to rooms director to hotel manager, right? Yeah. You were stamped a general manager. And I know you had to get back. You went back to Intercontinental, but at one of maybe their lower tier entry level cool. brands, right? Yeah. Uh, which yeah. I think was the Candlewood Suites, if I saw that, right? Yeah. But did you notice that? You're like, all right, I was a general manager already, even though it was very different than... Well, you like, notice it right away because um, you get to understand the amount of responsibilities that role has. Uh, it sounds very glamorous. Oh, I'm the general manager of property X, Y, and Z. Or I, the GM of hotel that. But when you have to have the responsibility, not only to your guest, but to your entire staff and the shareholders, either hotel owners or asset managers, and you need to have the tough conversations with them and with your staff, you realize that that position is far from glamorous. It's a position of extreme responsibility in which you, as a general manager, need to develop internal hospitality way more than what you thought you needed to. Because it becomes kind of a filtering position among or between ownership entities and asset managers or owners, hotel guests, and your team. So you need to filter information, always keeping transparency, of course, but making sure that everything that touches one or the other touches us not only at the right time, but with the right temperature. And that's, that's juggling act. You become the director of show business operations when you're the general manager. So that's why not everybody can do it. It requires a experience and a lot of personal skills. So I have a lot of respect for everybody in this business who get to say, I'm the general manager of this particular hotel, not because of the glamour that many people think it may have, but all the maneuvering that they need to do behind the stage to ensure that the operation from the perspective is a good experience. Gosh, that's, that's great advice. And for anyone listening, I think you just rewind that last two minutes. That's like your master's uh, class here, <laughs> learning about it. Because I just learned, you know, a good amount. I appreciate you sharing that. Oh, thanks. So as you continue, I said, we get you all back on track. You're with Intercontinental Hotels. You go to New Jersey, because I'm sure that was the opportunity that was presented to you. Mm, you yeah, yeah. Say, hey, want to get back in? Be old, and you'll be old. And you spend your two years there. You get it up and running. And you mm -hmm. come back to Miami Beach. Miami Beach, yeah. And where do you land? I landed at the Holiday Inn Miami Beach on Indian Creek as their general manager. Um, this was uh, with Progachani Group at the time. They own uh, that hotel. It was 82 rooms and obviously a full service restaurant. Uh, it was an interesting experience because I was there as a general manager for the Holiday Inn for, I would say, less than two years because the, youth, the owners, the Progachani Group, decided to convert the hotel into a condominium hotel. 
which luckily enough, I had experience with, right? In William Hotel. And uh, at the same time, it was perfect time for it to happen. They couldn't done it any later, otherwise it would be flat, to sell the units individually and create a condominium hotel. So they sold every single unit in the hotel and we created a hotel rental program. So the Holiday Inn transition with the same ownership group to 6060 Resort. So that's the change. That's the change. Same address, that's the change. But there's an even greater change. Once all the units are sold, uh, a friend of mine who's a partner with the Progacani group and also own a good percentage of uh, the Holiday Inn or the 6060, uh, him and I became partners and we own the hotel unit of the condominium, which is the entire common grounds, common elements, and shared components. Based on the condominium docks, we had absolute control of the hotel unit, and it was interesting. It was it was a great wow. So that's when you become an entrepreneur for the first time, really, mm -hmm. right? Because you weren't gen general manager anymore, but you saw what was happening. Yes, you created your group, which was uh, Optima Hospitality. Optima Hospitality, and yeah. you did that for a, a good time, five good years. Time. Yeah, for as long as we own and manage the sixty sixty resort residences in Miami Beach. Um, and it was a great experience, yes, yet it was mixed. It was mixed with, uh, I would say, some painful realities. The realities of owning and managing uh, a condominium hotel uh, are sometimes not all rose or pink. They come in different colors, and one of them is purple, and sometimes that's on your eyes. Um, well, well, give me an example. Give us an example. Example. I would say most of it was about timing and expectations. When one operates and manages a condominium hotel, you don't only have to be a cannibal to a unit, a REIT, or an asset manager. You have as many stakeholders as units you have. In a particular hotel, you have 82 units. And I would say most of them were owned by different unit owners. So in essence, you have 82 opinions. And sometimes not all of them are qualified. Some of them are very unqualified opinions on how to run the hotel, how to manage their property, how to manage the condominium, how to allocate expenses. And that is the nature of condo hotels. I will say the only one who really benefits greatly at the beginning is the developer. After that becomes um, a very difficult relationship. Uh, and I, perhaps the word is not difficult, it's complex. Complex is more adequate to use because even if it's great, when you have that many entities, that many uh, thoughts, minds, experiences, trying to make one single thing work, that's when, you know, the situations happen, and, and that's why people have some reservations about condominium hotels or resort condominiums, because even in the best case scenario, they're complex in nature due to the different layers that, that, that they feature. Uh, for me, it was difficult uh, because it was 2008 when we all know what happened. Yeah, it collapsed. For those of you who don't know, uh, condominium hotels are mostly um, run by the proceeds of the monthly assessments from the unit owners to be able to operate all the components of the hotel, anything from cable, water, electricity, insurance. Uh, some of the labor uh, comes from the condominium dues. So when you have a crisis such as the one that we have in 2008, and a lot of unit owners were going belly up, and a lot of those unit owners were not owners who had that as a second investment or second home. They had it because they thought they could flip it the next year or the next couple of months because that's what the real estate market dictated at the time. And all of a sudden, they encountered themselves with monthly fees, balloon payments that they really don't want to deal with. Then they stopped paying. So what happened when they stopped paying? The cash flows for the maintenance fees cease. Therefore, your hotel does not have the money to operate efficiently or accordingly to your brand standards. 
and banks start showing up and putting papers on units saying this unit is now owned by Wachovia or first unit or whatever the bank was at the time. So you come to a point in which, yes, you own the hotel unit, but the unit owners who are supposed nice. to, yeah, it is, it is, it was painful. Luckily, uh, we, we were able to find, uh, a way uh, out of that experience for the benefit of all by means of, um, of, of settlement and an acquisition by, by a neighbor. And uh, we were able to, to walk uh, and disappear in the sunset. <laughs> so, wow, that's, uh, it gets intense, especially you were doing it in like the hardest times. It was the hardest time. It was the hardest time because people got it. They got low interest rate. They, they, they thought they could flip it. A lot of them were brokers or realtors. And, you know, as I love my friends who are work, uh, brokers and realtors, but most of them have a very, you know, very optimistic uh, view of what the market is most of the times. And sometimes the reality is slightly divorced from, from what their view is. And the result always comes down to reality. And, you know, the reality was that the world collapsed briefly, but it did. And everybody felt it, some more than others. And our hotel, our condominium hotel, was not the exception. And when you have 30% of your units not contributing to the monthly fees as they should, and then another 20% paying later than what they should, you realize that you need to pay City of Miami Beach for water and sewer. What do you do with that? They're not going to wait for you. It, it was an experience. That's it scary. An experience. And that's uh, stress. I'm sure you had many sleepless nights. Well, like it's yeah, That's when all these white hairs started to appear and it never ceased to appear. Well, I ask you this because I had a experience as an entrepreneur. I was lucky enough to sell my company as a staffing company. Um, but it left a mark. I was like, I don't think I want to be a business owner again for like many years. Is that what happened to you after that experience? Well, I don't want to be a condominium hotel unit owner or have any participation in condominium hotels other than perhaps developing and selling. Yes. Um, because as I said, even in the best case scenario, it's a complex, complex uh, infrastructure to deal with. Um, we all know the best case scenario is hardly ever there. And then you gave us a little, a good class on this. And so you get out of that, you take some time to regroup, it looks like, and you yeah. start to see, all right, what am I going to do? How did you start to decide what you wanted to do? Okay. Um, luckily we are able to sell our interest in the hotel unit to our friends across the street from the Casablanca hotel. And they, they take it from there. Um, um, my wife was pregnant at the time and I decided to take some time off. Um, and luckily I was able to, to do that. And this opportunity in Montauk, Miss Hampton came up through a referral f with the real hospitality group, in Montauk, New York. And, uh, listen, I love New York. I love the East end of the island of Long Island. Why not? So I had a couple of conversations with John Parker in Manhattan who was a chief operating officer for, uh, the Indigo, uh, for real hospitality group. And I started working with them to lead Monto blue transition. It was ocean beach resort transitioning to a boutique type of style, uh, co-op in, in the island called Monto blue. And, um, uh, as we all know, Montauk is a very pristine area, especially during the summer or right after Memorial day until September, that becomes a hundred percent back to back, uh, not isolated to Monta, but Southampton, East Hampton, Amagansett, all those areas get to see, uh, the power of Manhattan and the tri-state area going there every single day of the summer, um, with great emphasis on weekends. So it was a very dynamic time and it was a good transition. It was, they did a great job as far as the, the renovation and the decor and make it operationally efficient because 
as we all know, some developers are not in the business and they think that, you know, this furniture looks great. Let's put it in a hotel room when they're oh, going to break their knees every time they try to clean a room. <laughs> oh, I know how that goes with the designers. That wasn't the case there. That wasn't the case there. Uh, it was fun. So that's, we moved to East Hampton uh, to run and operate Montauk Blue Hotel. And so you start to make some moves after this. You get back in the swing of things. You're in the hotels and we don't need to stop on every place. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to fast forward to when you start coming back to Miami Beach and mm -hmm. you are now the general manager of an interesting project that I think I've definitely met you at this time. I was actually providing staff at your hotel when I had my staffing company. So you get to this Washington Park Hotel on South Beach. Mm -hmm. You'd already come back to Miami. You were at the Wyndham. You kind of worked your way back down the coast. Let's to pick up the story there. How does mm -hmm. that happen? Because that is a unique place in Miami Beach that had some high hopes, I think. Yeah. Uh, like, didn't pan out exactly how everybody wanted. Yes. I was um, Highgate. Uh, High, it was the management entity for that particular hotel. Uh, they had a pre-opening general manager who later moved to another Highgate hotel called The Gates yep. uh, in South Beach. And that opportunity became available. Uh, I met with uh, Keith Space, who I'm sure you know in the business. Uh, he was uh, vice president of operations for the area. And um, we clicked. There was an opportunity that obviously was in my neighborhood since I lived in Miami Beach. I know the market very well. Uh, as previously elaborated, and I thought that it was a unique opportunity because this hotel is not just one hotel. This was an, an entire block with great outdoor areas comprised yes. the Kenmore Hotel, Taft Hotel, the Bel Air Hotel, and the last building was the Davis. So all those buildings were comprised within one single block, and that's why we created the complex called Washington Bar Hotel. We had great, great success. 2018, uh, we blew all numbers out of the budget in a positive way, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what I call it the keys of death for us because we did so well that the ownership entity at the time was uh, Carlisle and Wickup, they decided to put the hotel in the market. So what happened when you put a, such a successful hotel in the market? Uh, immediately, capital investment stops from ownership group. Projects that we needed to do to enhance the asset to remain competitive ceased to happen. And um, the good thing is that they had great supporting documentation as far as P&Ls and star reports to show that we did well. So they put the hotel for sale uh, and they were not successful right away, but eventually they, they sold the hotel. Uh, but I'll tell you this, this was one of the full service hotels that I managed that I enjoyed the most because every single unit was the same, but every single building was different. The experience that we created along with EO and the bar at the hotel were unique. The outdoor programming that we had was on point. Anything from hospitality nights to yoga on the, on the, on the yard, uh, meditation under the stars, uh, fashion shows. It was place. And I enjoy it thoroughly. It, it was a very rewarding place to work at. I had an excellent team. Uh, Highgate, of course, we all know is a, is a, is a very uh, boutique-driven company uh, with, that is primarily leisure markets, but, you know, they're very down-to-the-point, bottom-line type of executives who expect the best at all times. And um, so I had nothing but great things to, to say about that particular hotel. I enjoy it thoroughly. I wish they decided to keep it and enjoy it for what it could have been. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that wasn't the case. Yeah, that was a, it makes sense now because I remember when I was there, it was like the hop in place. You were in a great location next to all the nightclubs and yeah. right across the street from the police. So nothing bad was going to happen, right? <laughs> like it was just a great spot. And I enjoyed sending my team there. We had a bunch of housekeepers work team there. Yeah. Yep. So we definitely met. I know your office probably behind the front desk. I'm sure we shook hands. We just don't recall most of the time. Uh, so you make that change. And you go back, you don't burn any bridges. You're back with IHG. 
after yeah, this, yeah. right? So it shows how important this is in your career to make sure you leave places the right way. If there is anything that anybody could say from, from any career, but I would say hospitality, there are thousands of, hospi of hotels in the world, thousands of restaurants, but I'll tell you guys, there's only a hundred to 200 decision makers out there taking care of everything. So make sure that whatever or whenever you decide to make a move, be as professional as you can and give them as much time as you can. Because that boomerang, my friends, is coming back. And if you're left in good terms, it's coming with abundance of opportunities. Please, please, if you're in this career for the long run, make sure that you do that. Make sure that you break or not blown any bridges in the process. It is priceless. The amount of connections that you create at the early stages, those will be the same people you will be dealing later on in life if you remain in this career. But again, don't let the amount of hotels that you see in the world fool you. The decision makers are just a couple of hundreds and they all know each other. Yes, and I agree with you 100%. And I can say my last job that I left at the Lowe's, I gave six month notice. I gave them six months. I said, this is what you got. I'm heading yeah. out. But I wanted to do exactly what you said, which is great yes. advice. Yes. So you end up back mm -hmm. on Ocean Drive, back in the heart of South Beach, across yes. the street uh, from where you're at, just down the block. What was that like, that transition? Why make that? Was it because the hotel sold? Well, uh, well, I made that transition for a couple of reasons. As, I, as you know, uh, Washington Park was being sold, was being brokered to be sold. And uh, since I have a lot of connections in the industry, uh, uh, former associate, uh, not former associate, former colleague of mine, right, a Continental Hotel back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, uh, had this opportunity with Intercontinental Hotel Group Manage Hotels. So it wasn't a franchise. We, Intercontinental, managed the Z Ocean Hotel which was soft-branded, um, many people didn't know it, as Crown Plaza South Beach. Um, by all means, a full-service hotel with a very distinct boutique-style type of suites and uh, different culinary offerings that were not uh, the typical Crown Plaza or soft-branded offerings. We had a great partner uh, in, uh, within the premises called From Porsche Cafe. Big-time brunch. Everyone wants to be there. Big time branch, and this was our second uh, location from the original location in South Beach. And uh, it was very successful. It was very successful. But then, you know, as we all know, COVID came and uh, the hotel was due for some enhancements and renovations. And that's why one of the reasons why I decided to make back the move to, to IHG and this particular hotel, because we thought that it was going to happen an enhancement, a rebranding, an elevation to what the current uh, uh, features were, which by, by all means were excellent. It was just positioning to the next level. And then again, uh, a lot of things happened during COVID that did not permit uh, the ownership group to proceed with the enhancement, the expected upgrades that that property deserved. So, um, that's, that's what happened, uh, at, at yeah. The yeah. And so that was a, a rough time for ocean drive. You were yeah. at it during the roughest time. Cause I was working just up the street, one block at the Lowe's and it was rough during COVID. A lot of, uh, rough people around. I would say I almost got beat up on my pool deck and I was an executive at the hotel. Just telling people, Listen, I have, I have my backpack here. I had to purchase to my front desk team those uh, these, uh, chest cams. I don't know how you call them. Yeah, chest cam. Yeah. Just, okay, yeah. I had to go to Amazon and purchase to my staff members those cameras. So every time they interact with a guest, which is sad to say because we're in hospitality. We're not in the hostility business. We're in the hospitality business. Yeah. And when you have to protect yourself, and to provide some level of hospitality, you have to wear a camera. That tells you how rough it was in South Beach at the time. Forget about the people that will just go to your lobby and try to sleep there and grab a chair and take it out to the beach. 
you think about wrong things that could have happened, believe me, my friend, they did happen. Yeah. It was rough. It was scary. I remember like when we had a tourist get shot, we had a Clevelander hotel employee get shot at the front desk because someone couldn't get into the Oh, I remember bar. that. Like, and it's right. I'm just like thinking, I'm like, man, what's going on on our beautiful beach here? I want to talk. I want to ask you after this about what's going on spring break, what you think, because it's actually very nice now. Mm -hmm. I went out. There. I was there last weekend, by the way. Yeah, it looks good. So you're there. You're making you survive probably the roughest time. And then you make this interesting move where we finally get to start interacting in person. We talk to each other on LinkedIn here and there. Yeah. Yeah. How does this move to the Indigo Road Hospitality Group come? Because they're a new name. Well, I hadn't heard of them really down here before. How does that happen? Uh, this is a group that is, um, well, let me start by saying I am yes. so lucky I had to meet this wonderful amount of and great people because if I would have met this group 25 years ago, I wouldn't appreciate it because I wouldn't know what the difference was between different companies, management companies, individual owners, big brands. But since I've been through the grind, let's call it, and now finding a group which has a lot of good professionals, yet minimal to zero ego. Just a lot of people trying to do good things for people. To me, it was like, I got to heaven and I'm yet to die. That's how it feels. Wow. So um, the, the people have always been excellent. The... The familiarization process was nothing but hospitable from the get-go because it's something that uh, they, we breathe, nothing else but hospitality. That results and numbers are just a byproduct of what we do from an interaction, human perspective. Uh, well, I was, uh, as you know, at the Z Ocean Hotel, COVID, um, lack of renovation, lack of upgrades, I felt like, oh my gosh, this is hotel's light. Being with a group, being successful, and the hotel is being sold because it's successful, and then going back to a great company that you miss, but then again, the owner is not enhancing the product as it should, so there's the level of competitive is not there. So sometimes in this business, and don't, don't let that put you down, guys, uh, one, get discouraged because it feels like you're running in a cycle. But that's what life is. It's what we make out of it. So I, um, there was an opportunity with a particular hotel in Fort Lauderdale, which I'm not going to mention, obviously. Uh, and that created a connection with uh, the Indigo Road. And we started conversations about potential complete uh, management of the Alexander Hotel in, in Miami Beach and overhaul of the complete units, food and various areas, the entire process. Uh, and I was very excited because my condominium hotel background was certainly useful for such an enterprise. And the good thing about it is that it wasn't limited to condo hotel. It was with a hospitality sense. It was not just a transactional mode of Airbnb type of rentals. It was a hotel within a condominium hotel with great culinary and upgrade units. So we uh, entered this enterprise with ownership crew, the condominium hotel, condominium association for the Alexander. But then again, uh, what happens more often than not with these condominium hotels is that they don't get together and make the decisions for what is best, mid and long term. They're thinking about the urgency of now. And in all fairness to them, urgency is exactly that urgency and needs to be taken care of, but that does not necessarily takes, um, takes into consideration the, the long term proposition for the hotel or the business itself. Lucky enough, I uh, was able to remain with the Indigo Road Hospitality Group and become a uh, director of, of operations for the entire lodging group, uh, opening um, 
other hotels in the portfolio, lifestyle boutique hotels, which are beautiful and I would warm. tell you for listeners, if you haven't, take, just take a second to pause and look up the company because you're going to see some amazing products that they're putting out. And it seems like you're ramping up. You're putting out more and more now. Yeah. We just opened the George Hotel uh, a few weeks ago uh, with the independent restaurant with great reviews, uh, mentioning great publications. Uh, tomorrow we have a, a great announcement to make with the Skyland Lodge is being published. Um, it's, uh, one of the beautiful assets that we have in the mountains, Western mountains of North Carolina. Uh, we also have a Snowbird Mountain Lodge. We're opening the iconic Flatiron Hotel in Asheville within the next two to three weeks. Wow. Uh, and sometime before 4th of July weekend, sometime in June, we will be opening the River House, which will have a magnificent Italian concept and a spa as well. So we're very, very, very busy. And I'm happy to be here. As I said, I'm happy to be contributing with knowledge and expertise to, to all these projects, but at the same time, nurturing all the new talent that comes to the industry, letting them know that it is not easy, but it's more rewarding than what difficult is and that you will get to enjoy every single minute of this career if you put your mind to it. This is a, a career that if you like it, you know that you will like it on day two or three. And if you do, you'll be hooked for a lifetime. It's true. You got me fired up. I'm ready to get back on operations. Let's go. I'm fired up. So I want to just talk about where you're at a little bit more so people know, because I think it's very unique that it started, if I got it correctly, as a restaurant that has done so well. And then they added the hotel part to it. Is Am I getting that correct? Is that the history? Yes. yes. Um, the Indigo Row Hospitality Group started in 2009 uh, with Oak State House here in Charleston, and they have grown to different concepts of great success, uh, not only from the culinary perspective, but reputation perspective and kind of the employer of choice when it comes to restaurants, because, um, the, the, the entire hospitality approach, Steve Palmer, who's the chief visionary officer is, is, is the leader of our company and he's somebody who says and believes that culture is the most important thing. Every company has culture, whether they know it or not, is good or bad, whether they know it or not. And for us, a good culture is our business model. It's not a something that we put uh, uh, on a handbook or a manual, or we talk about our leadership conference. Culture is our business model. And we are determined to create a very hospitable culture where everybody feels safe, her, everybody has a seat on the table and everybody has a chance to contribute regardless of how different their backgrounds or their minds or their orientations are. We are here to create that experience everywhere that we touch. It's amazing. For you listening out there, I would say you're going to be very lucky to work with this company and knowing Gabriel now for almost two years now, which is amazing to say. I can feel that passion every time I talk to them. So make sure to check out their careers page. Gabriel, I know you how busy you are. You got openings coming, you got a lot happening. Um, but I got to ask this last question. So young Gabriel in Caracas was starting on your team today. He's on your pool deck or winning one of your restaurants. What advice do you have for him if he's starting now? Um, a few, a few. I will say the most important thing is if you don't like it, remove yourself from it as soon as you can. But if you do, enjoy every minute, every single minute of this career, regardless of your discipline, whether it's food and beverage, sales, marketing, purchasing, housekeeping, laundry, acquisitions, it doesn't matter. Every single discipline has a knowledge and an expertise that will build your career. Don't ever think that's not my job because that's not the uniform that you wear or that's not the department that costs your check. Our job, and you will understand that if you really know what you want 
and that is hospitality. Our job is to create experiences. And if we are fragmented or we are encapsulated into just one discipline, we will not be able to give that to our team members and or our guests. So think about this career of something that is about giving and feeling the reward. It's not about giving and taking. It's about being hospitable and creating experiences. Think about this. People are giving us their time for us to shape their experiences. What a privilege this is. When people celebrate their birthdays, some their divorce parties, their weddings, their anniversaries, they're giving us that time for us to create something that they will have in their memories for a lifetime. So to me, it's a privilege and I enjoy every single minute of it. And I will keep on doing this for a lifetime. And everybody who wants to be part of this, I will encourage them, do it. Listen, wear your shoulder pads and your knee pads because it's going to get rough. But it is so rewarding to see the final product, to see the outcome, to remember every hotel that you open, to remember the first day, to always think about everything that could go wrong and went wrong and still be here. That's what this career is all about. If you want to be behind a desk and have a sweet check, please choose something else. This is a career where you will be working every single day of your life, but at the same time, you will get the benefit and joy to enjoy the gratitude that this career only can give. That is, did you practice this before you came on today? Because this is an amazing no. ending to this podcast. I love that. I love the energy. I love it. I love how you finished it. I think it's great for people hearing it because I talked to so many students and they're not sure it's hard. It's this. You just you got to get you in front of some of these students. I think this is what's going to be exciting for them here. Well, Gabriel, I appreciate you sharing this time with me. This was I love awesome, it. awesome getting to know you some more and learning about your journey. And is there a place that someone can connect with you? What's the best place they can do that? Um, anyone who's listening. Well, uh, they can connect with me through the Indigo Row email, the website has my email. My email is uh, gperez at the indigorow.com. Uh, you reach out to me. I'll give you my cell number. Uh, feel free to call me if you have a doubt, if you hit a brick wall in your career or in your day too. I may not have the answer to solve it, but I may have a formula of how to get out of it without by mitigating some pain. So that's something that experience gives you. And I'm glad that I have tons of those. And um, if I could be of service to you as, as a newcomer to the industry, if I could be of service to you as a long-term hospitality career individual, I am humbled to provide such service and expertise to you uh, because somebody did it for me too. And this is a business of giving back. Wow. I'm very grateful that you spent this time with us today. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for taking, to, taking me into consideration. And uh, uh, there are greater times ahead. Forget about the forecast. Forget about inflation. Forget about downturn in the economy. Nothing takes a place of hospitality where hospitality works.